it's time to continue. And uh, on the agenda, we titled this slot Advanced OpenMP Programming, probably only because of the lack of a better name. Actually, on my slides, I just call it a continue continuation of the introduction. And uh, I think Ruth's talk was also already pretty advanced, and uh, I will cover some uh, open questions uh, pointed to some other or extending language features, and uh, most importantly, discuss the, Fibonac the solution to the Fibonacci uh, problem. And that's my agenda. Uh, I will talk a little bit on avoiding overhead, which will turn out to be the solution for the Fibonacci code, and then look at Fibonacci. Uh, I will briefly talk about the schedule clause and then give you a short OpenMP thread binding how-to. And uh, the other two things are really uh, are grayed out, probably because we don't have sufficient time um, to discuss them in detail today. I just want to give you some pointers to advanced tasking clauses. So uh, most of you only heard about tasking today and then talking about dependencies and other optimizations is, is uh, according to my experience, too early. But uh, I just want you to make aware or want you to be aware uh, that there are even more opportunities in this task-based uh, programming model. This is why I have them here on my slides. And then we have uh, a brief, um, another commercial sketch from Root. He's, he will go and propose a new uh, programming model. Is it official from Oracle already, Root? Or it's soon to be official, probably, huh? OK, he will comment on that later on. And then we have uh, more time for the labs. OK, avoiding overhead. Um, assuming that you have written a library that, that performs some linear algebra uh, operations, like a matrix matrix or a matrix vector or multiplication. So you, you offer a very, general, uh, g very generic and general interface. And um, so you take argument, for example, the matrix size on the vector size, con considering a matrix vector multiplication. But if the user uses your library for all his matrix vector multiplication needs, he also might sometimes put in a very small matrix and a very small vector. And especially on the systems we have today with large caches, for example, 18 megabyte of L3 cache just on a single processor, it not always makes sense to go parallel. So if you have a small matrix and a small vector that fits into the processor, into a single processor, or especially into the um, caches of a single core, it uh, often doesn't make sense to go parallel. And this if here as a clause at the parallel region uh, can help you with that. So you can put in an expression, and if this expression evaluates to uh, true, the parallel region will be executed as usual, meaning a team of thread will be created. If the expression evaluates to false, for example, if matrix dimension is less than 1,000, in an artificial example, then the parallel region will be executed with one thread only. So this if construct is really an option so that you can provide one routine that goes parallel if uh, going parallel is uh, expected uh, to pay off and otherwise it will be executed uh, well with just a single thread. So the overhead of thread creation and possibly uh, privatization of data and other things can be avoided. And something very similar is, or well, the same concept is available for tasks. So there's an if clause that can, al or the if clause can also be put onto a task. And if the if uh, clause expression evaluates to true, a task will be created with all the things I explained, like it will be put onto a work queue and other things. But if the if clause evaluates to false, it will be executed immediately. There's still some overhead of OpenMP. Uh, at least with current implementations. So a task will be created, but it will be executed immediately. You can save the overhead of putting it onto a task queue and then later on by the same or different thread taking it off for execution again. So the if clause can really help us and uh, save some overhead if we decide that the work uh, performed in tasks is too small. And um, this is uh, now the original measurement of the Sudoku solver on that machine. So 
the speed up is worse than what I discussed in the previous talk. It goes from slightly below seven seconds to one point, I don't know, 1.3 maybe <coughs> uh, seconds, which is a speed up uh, of 3.7. And um, uh, we take a took a look at the code with a performance analysis uh, tool. And this slide is pretty crowded, but uh, tomorrow Dirk will give you an overview of some of the most usable uh, performance tools for OpenMP. Uh, here's uh, just some results uh, for analyzing this code um <coughs> uh, with these tools. And I want you uh, uh, to take a look first here on the left-hand side. That's a tool named Skalaska. It performs an event-based profiling, and that gives us an overview of what's going on. So I don't want to go into details, but uh, the event-based profiler gives us uh, a notification whenever an event occurs, for example, when a task is created so and, and ended. And that's one uh, of the events that we can uh, examine with this Kalaska tool. And what we can see here is, uh, sorry, here, every thread is executing about 1.3 million tasks in just, for the uh, selected configuration, 5.7 seconds. If we do the math, the average duration of a task is 4.4 microseconds. That's really, really short, considered that we're doing a lot of work, uh, uh, cons considering that uh, for every task there's some overhead uh, involved. Think of managing the task queue. And uh, the other tool that is uh, a vampire from, uh, from Dresden, uh, it performs a tracing, so it takes an, a detailed look at, at all the events over the time and performs an analysis to give us a condensed uh, overview of what's going on in the program. And uh, here we took, uh, you can get a, a graphical representation of what the threads are doing over the time. And um, uh, Dirk colored the, the different uh, threads and the different activities in the threads, so whether they're busy executing a task or whether they're waiting in a task uh, wait and things like that. And we looked at the different recursion levels that occur in the Sudoku solver, so that the 16 by 16 field, many, many different uh, Sudokus can be examined, so the recursion level is pretty, um, uh, pretty, depth, pretty deep. And if you look at the highest level, which is one of the first configuration, only a few fields are uh, already selected, and there's a large tree below. The including time, meaning working on the current field and all the others uh, of, per of a task, so the runtime of a single task was 0.167. And uh, at level 82, I don't know what, do you remember the maximum death, Dirk? No, okay, I don't remember the maximum death either, but there's 82, so there's 83 here already visible, so there's more to come. I don't know the maximum, but that I guess is rather close to the maximum. The average, uh, the, the duration was already down at 2.2 microseconds. So that means we are way below, or we can go way below the average that we could compute with 1.3 million tasks in 5.7 seconds. And that means at the end, the overhead of the task in relation to the work it is p that is performed in the task is absolutely increasing. Okay, so here a task is really a lot of work and only a small amount of overhead, and here a task is mainly overhead. So what can we do in order to solve this situation, improve the situation? Yes? Only go parallel on the high level, right? I would uh, phrase it slightly different. At a certain recursion level, we have to stop the recursion. And um, we looked at this for the Sudoku solver. So that's um, <coughs> yeah, th th that's the summary. If we have created sufficiently enough tasks to keep all the cores busy, we can stop creating tasks and should just concentrate on, on the compute. And um, this is what we did here. So the green bars, that's the new version. So even for a single thread, we save some overhead. And uh, for multiple threads, we save overhead as well. Uh, so we get a speed up of uh, above 16 with 32 threads. But also remember, 
that we have a much better uh, starting point uh, here. So uh, the, the, the speed up here over the naive serial uh, single-threaded version, uh, which would be probably, uh, yeah, I don't know, in the mid-20s. So if you take a look at this uh, Sudoku algorithm, it was really hard for us to, to find an optimal uh, abortion criterion. If you think about the Sudoku, in case you come up with a great criterion, we're happy to let you know. Uh, we would be happy if you let us know. But um, I think we artificially uh, introduced an, a no notation of the recursion, recursion level, and I think when we reach a level of nine, we cancel the creation of new tasks. Is that correct, Dirk? I'm unprepared. I, d I don't remember exactly. Y we stopped uh, after the first two rows. Okay, that that might also be. So we looked at different, several different metrics, and uh, the reason why I'm explaining that here is that for some algorithms, uh, the solution, like saving the overhead, is really simple. But coming up with uh, a, a good idea is, is not so simple, right? So you could either look at the recursion level, but this the, the tree is really imbalanced. So sometimes you find a solution in the board and it's done, and sometimes you have to try many different uh, numbers, so it's not a balanced uh, tree. And uh, I think this is, I don't know, heuristic. After looking at the first two rows, we have created sufficiently enough uh, tasks uh, that was pretty good on this architecture. As a rule of thumb, thumb I would say that you should aim for at least 10 times the number of tasks that you have a uh, course. So that's something uh, some scheduling strategies in the implementations are made for, for example, with task stealing and other stuff that we didn't discuss today. But if you have uh, this 32-core uh, machine, you should generate at least 300 cores to make sure everything um, uh, is busy enough. OK, so we don't have an optimal solution, but with this cutoff, um, it works r surprisingly well. But if you look at smaller, um, Sudokus, or uh, actually even larger Sudokus, then coming, then our cutoff strategy was not uh, the right approach. And this cutoff means that at a certain time you stop creating more tasks. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, two other things on saving saving some overhead, and then I will take a look at the Fibonacci. So. I talked about these implicit barriers that are attached to every work sharing construct, like the four and um, uh, the single and things like that. There's a clause named no weight in OpenMP, and if you have, um, if you add that, the implicit barrier will be gone. So if you take a look at, at this two loops here, so we iterate from one to n minus one, including n minus one. We update A of Y, and here we have a second loop, and we read A of I. So we have to make sure that when here a certain A of I is read, the update has been performed. But in this special case, where we have a single parallel region that's, en that, that's enclosing the both wor four work sharing construct, we have the same schedule. Then we can put the no weight in here in order to make sure that here is no barrier, because we really don't need the barrier. In principle, some smart compilers could figure out that there's no barrier needed or no barrier necessary, but in practice, I didn't see these optimizations happen. So if you have many uh, loops of the same structure and uh, you have individual loops and uh, not rather complex expressions, uh, you can get rid uh, of the barriers in between. But really make sure that uh, the threads responsible for a certain i here are also responsible for a certain i in the other loop. Otherwise, you could run into data races. And if you have nested loops, uh, like this one here, which are perfectly nested, meaning they are in code directly, directly nested inside each other, and furthermore, the inner loop iterations do not depend on the outer loop iterations, like here, the K loop does not depend on the J loop, and the J loop does not depend on the I loop. Uh, there's a clause named collapse in OpenMP, and collapse 2 means that the two outermost loops are fused together by the compiler, so that in overall you have a larger iteration space. And the larger the parallel iteration space is, the better uh, you can expect your uh, speed up because you're parallelizing 
more work. And in this particular example, you could also say collapse three, and then the compiler would fuse all the three loops into a single one, which you could do manually, but usually that that's, uh, results in ugly code and also is uh, something uh, where you could easily make an error or mistake and the compiler is better at doing this automatically. Okay, so these are some tricks that for some particular application paid off uh, for applications I worked with. This is why I have them here. And now let's uh, take a look at uh, Fibonacci. I discussed it at lunch and in the break here with several people and I heard even uh, more talking about it. So apparently it's uh, pretty interesting from a parallelization point of view. So I think when we discussed the um, exercise solution, I already explained I need a parallel region to create a team of thread and then a single in order to have just one st thread start my computation. Here was the first call to the recursive Fibonacci function and then within the first call I'm creating uh, the first task, the second task. I need a shared X and a shared Y to make sure that X and Y are not thread private and then I need a task wait because before I compute the sum of X and Y I have to be sure that these two tasks are ready. So in the break I came up with an illustration here, so that's probably too small to be visible from the background, but maybe you can see it uh, afterwards. So that's a, that's a recursion uh, tree as, as I would uh, visualize it. And uh, just to be sure, if you really want to compute the Fibonacci numbers, there are better ways to do so. Because if you take a look here at the, set at the third level, these two trees are already identical and that's what happens here. We're computing the same result again and again and uh, you could come up with a closed expression uh, to compute FIB n in a much more efficient uh, way. But what happens is that after the first step there are two tasks create, created and the task wait only waits for these two. And then every task is creating two new tasks and the task wait there is only also only waiting for these two tasks. So this is that the task weight doesn't imply a barrier or a full stop or full synchronization over the whole task tree, but only at uh, two selected tasks on a certain uh, level. In order to understand what is the parallelizable uh, work here, you have to take a different look at the task. So that's what I try um, uh, to visualize here with the red and the blue uh, boxes. Uh, so at the first Fibonacci it, uh, call, it contains the whole compute time. And you create two tasks, here these two red bubbles, and they each uh, contain about half or 50% of the whole compute time. And then if you take the next step, again, we have two tasks, and sooner or later it will be slightly imbalanced, but we can ignore that uh, for this discussion. And uh, it in the end, you can see that every task uh, is a representative for the compute time of its whole uh, well, task creation chain or the whole tree below. And this is the parallelism that you can exploit. So if you want to understand why this speeds up regardless of the synchronization, the synchronization is only performed on the way back. So that means when these two tasks are almost done. And these two tasks contain the whole amount of the compute time. And this is why, in principle, we can see a speed up. We didn't see a speed up for the uh, code in the examples because there was so much overhead. So if you take a look, what we do here in a task, it's a subtraction, integer subtraction, assignment, and a function call. So that's maybe 100 cycles or something like that. And we create a task. That's the overhead. So the task is several function calls copying something. Sooner or later copying it back. Cache is cold, as we say. So there are also some caching effects, may, uh, maybe, <coughs> because uh, the Y might be gone, uh, for instance, or the X might be gone, and uh, you have to bring it to execution. So that's more overhead than actual compute time. So what in the end, we're parallelizing is the overhead, and we're, f we're just parallelizing the overhead. We cannot expect a big speed up. And personally, I would say that that lucky small improvement that we saw were just uh, luck. So with the best configuration, it should more or less stay the same. But what can we do? 
in order to improve that. How can we really get a speed up? Yes. Well, terrible recursion is changing the algorithm. And yeah, if you want to get the Fibonacci numbers, do something different. But uh, think of we're searching an element in a graph, or we're, we're doing something with the graph nodes. It's a, um, uh, a binary graph, a binary, b binary graph or binary tree, sorry. So that means for every node, we have uh, two descendants, left and right and also a value element, and we do some compute with a value element, and we are using tasks in order to parallelize uh, that, because we don't have a single loop that, that would allow us to run over all the graph nodes. So then we cannot do tail recursion. So we want to we want to uh, apply this pattern. Yes? Okay. I can do, yeah, I, ca I could use bigger tasks and do more steps in there. Um, so that's kind of the performance I saw in an older implementation, so there was some speed up. Um, that's the blue one is the optimal speed up, and that's what I saw with a different configuration, so I got a slight speed of something like 2.5, different machine, different runtime, different settings, so I was even luckier then. But uh, actually my proposal again would be to do a cutoff. So really, if I have created sufficiently enough tasks, stop creating more and go on with the compute. And here's the if, so that means if I encounter a certain n which is uh, smaller than 30, assuming my input is large enough, then I just want to compute the result and not create any more tasks. So I want to save the overhead. And um, in real code, I have to correlate this cutoff criterion, the 30, with the input, but that wouldn't fit onto a single slide. So assuming input is 35, uh, my n, uh, so the, the task would be executed directly without the overhead of putting it into any queue, without the overhead of any task scheduling, if n reaches uh, 29. And, uh, oh no! So that's, that's a white line on the white background. <laughs> so you can, you can see it here, damn it, I copied the slide to the new uh, slide uh, master. So you can see it here where the red line, uh, where the black line has some holes. So it's almost linear here, but it's it's not not perfect. Ah, oh, oh. I didn't shake. I'm sorry. I hope I hope you can see it. If you take a look at the PDF, the <laughs> presentation is in, in the web. Huh? It's the same in the PDF. It's, uh, it's the same in the PDF. Okay, I didn't shake. I can do an uh, I can apply a new template in the break and update the slides. But I think on maybe in the PDF you can see it even better. So here are the small holes in the lines and uh, like this is the curve. So I was wondering what's the difference here? So why I did some more experiments. Why is there a constant offset between the optimal speed up and, and what I'm getting here, uh, particularly after reaching this uh, uh, number of threads of four? The reason is that the OpenMP if is not as efficient as it could be. So it's still, as I explained, the task is created, but it's executed immediately. So we still have some overhead. For example, um, uh, yeah, some internal op OpenMP overhead. Uh, what exactly and how much that is actually depends uh, on the implementation. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's actually measurable. So it's, again, a few functions one or two function calls, I would guess, or in the order of one or two function calls. So what I did here is I used the, the a cutoff in C. So that means if my n is small enough, I cause call a clone of that routine that looks exactly the same except for all the OpenMP stuff. This is why I call it serial uh, FIP. So that, that means I implement the cutoff not with the OpenMP if, but with the uh, uh, native C if. And this is now what I end up with. Oh, that's black. So it's exactly, or more or less exactly, on top of the blue line, which is the theoretical maximum of the speed up. So what we did is we looked at here, at this recursive algorithm. We created tasks enough to keep get all the cores busy, and then we stopped creating tasks and continued in a more or less serial way so that the these 
if you look at the task tree, or if you imagine a task tree, that these leaves of the task tree are computationally in te expensive enough to justify the overhead of the tasks. So a task really is not expensive. It's order of five to ten function calls uh, in an implementation like the Intel implementation. Uh, I didn't have numbers for the actual uh, one in my head, but that's something we looked at for the Intel 13.0 uh, or 13.0 implementation. So let's say 10 function calls. It's really not expensive, but it's much more than what we did in a task within the simple, simple Fibonacci example. And uh, also for the Sudoku, at the very end, it was measurable. So if you limit the number of tasks and implementing this cutoff, that's a very good tuning strategy for these recursive task-based algorithms. Does this explain what we can do with Fibonacci in order to get a speed up. Are there any questions? There's a question. Yes. Uh, so the question is, can we change the cutoff criterion? You, you should actually do that. So the static one like I have on my slides is not a good idea. So you, you should depend it on the input data set on your machine. Yeah, so th that would be an optimization. That's, at the end of the day, the quality of your program. If you want to really go all the way and optimize it, then you should uh, make it dependent on certain input variables. Any, else, any further questions? Okay, we didn't do any magic, we just understood what's going on. So at the end of the day, it's uh, after you understood it, it's always simple, but that's true for so many aspects in life. Good. Back from tasks to two more topics that I would like to discuss. So I had it on the one slide uh, where I illustrated um, the, the, the no weight. Uh, if you have a four work sharing construct, you can make use of the schedule, uh, schedule clause. So you can say schedule static, and that's the default. But you can also say schedule dynamic or schedule di uh, guided. And that will mean, uh, or let me first explain dynamic. So dynamic, and you can specify a chunk size, and the chunk size is the number of iterations that are grouped together to form something I would call a work package. So the iteration space is divided into blocks of chunk size chunk uh, iterations. If you don't specify it, the default is one. And then the blocks are scheduled to the threads in the order in which the threads finish their previous work. So you give one block to each thread, and then when the first thread is ready, it acquires the next block, and so on. When could this be useful in a four-work sharing construct? Yes? Right, if we get a load imbalance. So that means if some iterations are computationally more expensive than, the, than others. If they are more expensive, the thread has to compute longer for his work package. So the default is static, in which the iteration space is divided into as many blocks as there are threads of approximately equal size. So that's what I also illustrated uh, 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 this morning on, on this uh, slide with the pseudo uh, code. And if one thread has more work to do because some of its iterations are computation more expensive, you have to wait for this slowest thread in order to get the complete or the final result. So if you have a load imbalance, schedule dynamic uh, could be a solution. A different solution would be to have a task, one task per iteration. Uh, that could also work. And schedule guided is a very special case. It's similar to dynamic, but the block size it starts with is, imp is an implementation defined value that is then decreased exponentially down to the chunk size specified, and if not specified, it's one. So that's of particular good use if the most expensive blocks are present at the f uh, or are part or are the first iterations. If the first iterations are most expensive, so you distribute the big chunks of iterations to the different threads, and at the end you distribute the cheaper iterations to fill up the differences in the runtime. That's the theory. Uh, the goal is or the intent is uh, to save some overhead. Uh, because when the thread has to ask, is there a uh, block, work block available here in the dynamic um, that, that costs uh, some overhead and with schedule guided, these requests, or there are uh, less requests in terms of the absolute number. 
The default is schedule static, and that works best and gives you the best performance if all iterations are uh, computationally uh, of the same cost, because then you can just distribute uh, a number of threads chunks, and all the threads can work independently. There's one exercise, uh, I think exercise five, and uh, in order to get the best speed up, you have to s do uh, you have to select the right um, loop. Uh, for parallelization, and then you have to also reason about uh, how computationally expensive are the different iterations and which schedule should I uh, use. We can discuss that later on. And I want to close this talk with an OpenMP thread binding how to. So, Root shortly explained or briefly explained uh, uh, thread binding. In order to under really understand what's going on um, or what to do, it might be useful to get an information about how your system looks like. And there, are two there, there are plenty of tools uh, available that can illustrate you uh, the architecture, but there are two tools that I personally like and use, and this is what I would recommend. So one is CPU info that comes with Intel MPI. On our cluster, the open MPI is the default, so you have to, uh, you have to switch. Oh, wait, my shell is gone. Let's make it bigger. Or do you switch all oh, that? That's that's really big. Uh, Intel MPI open MPI. So that's specific. The other way around. That's specific to our cluster. And then we have this to CPU info, which gives us some information about the architecture we're running on. So what does it tell us here? We have four processors, meaning four packages, four sockets of type Intel Xeon uh, something, some serial numbers. Uh, you can look them up online what that means. Uh, so we have four cores per socket. So four times four is 16, but the two computes it for us. And we have one thread per core, so that means hyper-threading uh, is disabled. This is, uh, well, it says processor, but the first column here uh, is the uh, identification of the cores uh, of the local um, uh, sorry the first column is the operating system identifier of a core so when the operating system boots up it assigns one core with zero the next one with one and so on but thi but this mapping is not as fixed or as deterministic as you might think so with a after an operating system update, or especially when a four socket system after a reboot or a BIOS modification, the mapping might look different. So sometimes it, it's interesting um, uh, to see uh, how this, um, yeah, course, course zero and one, are they on the same processor uh, socket? Are they on the same core, for example, with hyper-threading, or what's their relation uh, to each other? And right now, I'm a little bit confused about the column identification here. So I thought this is a this is a socket, but it says core ID. Do I'm am I package ID is a socket, but I have a four socket system. Why does it name the co uh, socket zero and then two? Okay, we don't know, but okay, we have we have uh, four sockets. The first socket is socket zero. The second socket is socket two, and so on. So that again might be different. And actually, we had two systems with the exact same processor, but uh, one from I think Bill and the other from HP. And on one system, the core, the logical core zero and one were on the same socket, and on uh, the other system, they were located on different sockets. So the Bendo has some influence and how things are uh, named here. So these are two different sockets, and that means processors or the logical cores 0 and 1 are on two different sockets. So if you put two threads on 0 and 1, they are spread among two different sockets. If you put four threads on 0, 1, 2, and 3, they are spread among the four different sockets. As we will see, that might have advantages and disadvantages. And, oh yeah, here it says, actually, okay, I should have scrolled down. So that's a package identifier, 0, 2, 4, and 6. And it tells us here for the processors which 
operating of which uh, cores as, as named by the operating system are located on this uh, processor. So if you want to put threads together, four threads together on a socket, uh, you have to uh, bind them to the logical processor 0, 4, 8, and 12. Might be surprising, and uh, also it might change uh, after the reboot. And that's a cache um, uh, architecture here. So we are on an older system, four socket, that's probably something like Tigerton, a very old machine, Cluster X2. Uh, so on, on Westmere, as I introduced on Monday, we have a different uh, cache architecture, but the tool also gives you this information. The other tool I like is hwlock-ls from the hwlock library that usually comes with open MPI. Um, where is it? Where does it start? Here. So it gives me a summary of the machine. It's a machine with 30, uh, 63 gigabyte of memory. And that's the first socket. That's a locality domain zero. And that's my level two cache. And that's then the first core. And it has 32 kilobyte of L1 data cache and 32 kilobyte of L1 instruction cache. And yeah, so the L2 cache is shared between uh, these two uh, cores. And these are processor zero and processor uh, four. I like this tool a little bit better because I have some tools that, that can automatically pass this uh, parse this representation, but it's uh, just uh, a matter of preference. So there are tools available that, that can tell you what core zero and core one actually mean. Good. <coughs> now that we have multiple threads and multiple cores, you as a programmer or executor of an application, you have to decide how to bind the threads. And sometimes and you have at least two basic options. So you can put these threads close together, or you can spread them apart on the machine. Or you can run serially, or just you can just uh, uh, use a whole machine. So if you put threads far apart, as will be kind of the default on the machine we just looked at, um, so that you put them on 0 and 1 and 2 and 3, uh, that you're using four sockets with four threads that may improve the aggregated memory bandwidth. I talked about it briefly today, as more in detail on Monday, and Ruth also mentioned it. Every processor comes a NUMA system with locally attached memory because the memory controller has been integrated onto the processor. And that means if you're accessing the memory from two processors, uh, in general, you could expect a higher memory bandwidth than if you accept, uh, access the memory from just one processor. Also, if you use two physical processors, two sockets, uh, there are good chances that you have more ag aggregated cache size, especially on today's system with the larger L3, large L3 caches, uh, that might make sense. However, it might lead to performance problems like this fall sharing, because you don't are not sharing caches. And it might decrease the performance of synchronization construct. So, construct. so for example, a critical is implemented with something like a log variable. So there's some variable that has to be acquired or written to, modified, whatever you might call it, whenever in a critical is uh, entered. And if threads compete for these variables, these log variables, and they're running on different sockets, uh, the cache coherency, as explained on Monday, takes a bit longer to transport these variables and if the threads are running on the same socket. So putting threads close together uh, has some uh, performance, like, uh, for example, this improved synchronization construct. But of course, it has uh, some uh, disadvantages, like you cannot profit from the higher memory bandwidth, the aggregated cache sizes, and things like that. Sometimes you can probably guess for your kernel or your code what is the best option. If you're unsure, just try and then select uh, the best one. And how do you do it? So in OpenMP, uh, we have the concept, in OpenMP4, we have the concept of places. And the place captures uh, several cores or execution engines in general that can run OpenMP threads and put them together. And uh, the place concept is really, really flexible, but I don't want to go into details here. The most important setting is probably OMP places equals cores. So that means every core will be, uh, 
every core will create one place, or sorry, you have a list of places, and every uh, place in there represents um, one core. And then you have different thread affinity policies. So you can say how to distribute the OpenMP threads onto these places. You can say spread, which will spread the threads far apart. And you can say close, which will put the OpenMP threads close together on this list. And master will actually put all the threads on the same place as a master uh, thread. So that implements exactly the strategy I explained on the previous slide. And here's an example. So that's an artificial uh, N, uh, machine. So that's eight processors, which uh, will um, eight eight cores. Sorry, it will correspond to eight um, places in a second. And each core consists of four hyper threads. Uh, so that's that's my uh, indication of these bubbles here. So I have sixteen. No, I have thirty-two. Uh, eight times four is thirty-two logical cores in my system and eight physical uh, cores here. If I say OMP places equals cores, I get a place list that ex looks exactly like this. So I have place one, a zero, consisting of the first of the uh, hyper threads that are located in the first physical core, place one with the next uh, four and so on. And if I exactly know the, m know if I exactly know the mapping of my operating system identifiers to the hardware, I could explicitly also define the place list. So that's that's not my recommendation for, especially not for novice users, but if you wanted to benchmarking, you really want to control where the different threads are running. And for example, if you have one thread performing I.O. and you want only this one on that core and the other somewhere else, you can construct a place list uh, in the way that you can come up with exactly this mapping. And uh, here, I have a nested parallel region, so that's my initial master thread running here. Then I create a Pragma OMP parallel with four threads. Uh, num threads four is missing here, so uh, I copied the wrong slide. I will also update that. And I say proc bind spread, and it will spread the threads as far apart as possible in this place list. So there's no direct connection to the hardware architecture by um, there's not necessarily a direct connection to the hardware co uh, architecture when it comes to the place list, but the way defined it here, we define it here, there is a direct connection. So we now have these four threads running um, on these four uh, cores, which are pretty far apart. And if we then have an inner parallel region uh, with a proc bind close, I just illustrated this for this second thread here, it will put the threads uh, close together, but still make use of the diff two different places. What's important to understand, if you go into detail here, is that for the spread uh, affinity policy, the place list is partitioned. So after the spread, this thread only continues with this place list consisting of two places. And this one with the places P2 and P3. And this is why the close will equally distribute the threads over these to places. But uh, nested OpenMP is not the, not the standard case, but uh, it's important for some applications. This is why we made it uh, work well with nested OpenMP in, in, in uh, or with the affinity concept of OpenMP4. But for you to take away is set OMP places equals cores, and then you can uh, use this proc bind clause, or there's an OMP underscore proc underscore bind environment variable with spread, you can spread them apart. With closed, you can put them together. If you want to dive into deeper levels of control, you can manually construct the place list, but that's not my recommendation uh, to start with. Does this make sense? So when you want to do this NUMA aware allocation, you also have to spread the threads apart in order to make use of different uh, sockets, so there are three words here. You can say, I think, sockets, cores, and threads. Sockets uh, stands for the well, physical sockets. Cores is intended to stand for the physical cores, and threads is intended to uh, stand for the smallest hardware unit that's capable of running an OpenMP thread, for example, a hyper thread. However, every OpenMP implementation has to document what these three words stand for, and it can also 
introduce user-defined uh, descriptions. So, and through this, I just want to run very briefly. And um, there's a task yield construct. So if you have some imbalance in between tasks, and you know there are sometimes very long-running tasks, you can interrupt them. Well, interruption is probably not the right word. You can allow the runtime to put them to sleep. I guess that's better. So if a task yield construct is encountered, the runtime can put the current task to sleep, switch to a different one, and later on resume the task at the task yield. It's a performance optimization that in theory I thought I could use it pretty often in the code. In practice, I never had to use it because runtimes or the results were sufficiently good. But if you have tasks and some are really long running and you foresee a deadlock, no, no, not a deadlock, but you foresee a load imbalance that uh, this long running task um, is occupying or some long running tasks are occupying all the threads, um, then you might make use of the task yield. And that's an example uh, for that. Here, so I have a routine that's doing something useful, meaning computationally intensive work, and there's some critical in here, and um, I have my routine foo. I create a number of n tasks. I have a parallel region somewhere outside. I'm doing something useful. I compute some result, and then I need a lock in order to update my shared data structure, which is what I do in something critical. So what I do here is I try to get the lock. I didn't talk about the API routines. They are part of the OpenMP reference card that I handed out, and it's similar to locks in general in shared memory programming. So if I don't get the lock, I say, well, I don't have to actively wait for it. Put this task to sleep and uh, thread try go off and uh, search for something better. Uh, if I do get the lock, I do the critical and then release the lock. So that means if I know I'm waiting for some resources, like a file to get ready or for a lock, I can uh, suspend the thread and a uh, task and give the thread free. So that's just the explanation just put in with the word. And then there are task dependencies. So I explain tasks as all the independent things that can be executed in parallel. If they are not necessarily independent, but sometimes some tasks have to be executed before others. We have the task dependencies in OpenMP. And um, they are uh, defined in terms of a data flow. I don't want to go into detail here, but I really want to make you aware that we have this feature. So this simple code is, is kind of you know, is taken from, from a sketch of an application from our VR group here. So for every time step in a big data set, it loads some data uh, and then does something with the data. So I have different tasks here. And uh, after I first have to load the data before I can do independently certain uh, visualization uh, features or tasks with the data. And uh, so I have some dependencies here. So this first task has an output dependence of a variable x. Here, the variable x might be an array in which I'm writing the data, or it might be something artificial that I just introduced. So there's one x, and that means this task is writing a token or whatever into x. And that means these tasks, which are created after t1, depend with an independence on x. And that means they can only start as soon as the out dependence uh, is fulfilled, meaning that this task has been completed. However, they can be executed independently. And the reason why I said is that this is a data flow model is, uh, so for example, in order to make this correct, because we are reading x, we have to wait for all the other tasks that are writing into x. And uh, why is, uh, and, and yeah, I hope that makes sense. So we are writing something into x, and later on we're going to read it, so we have to wait until the write operation is completed in order to get uh, the current result. The task, these are task dependencies in OpenMP. So tasks are complicated by itself. Task dependencies, getting uh, them right so that you can come up with a parallel, efficient parallel implementation is by no means simpler. It actually complicates things, but for some applications that can be pretty successful. So here are some examples that I have in my slides. And uh, for those of you doing linear algebra, 
Uh, in there were tasks and task dependencies, important implementations by third-party libraries since a long while. And with OpenMP, we have shown that, that we can do equally well you know, with a supported standard right in the compiler. So that's a block Koleski uh, with a pretty complicated task dependency graph and OpenMP runtimes uh, are possible uh, to uh, well map the task efficient uh, to the hardware architecture and the available threads. Certainly an advanced topic. We have some infos on the web on that, but uh, this was really meant as a pointer towards uh, uh, future features for you. And finally, there's a task group that's a new synchronization feature for tasks in OpenMP. So a task group is just a simple thing. It is a structured block, and all the tasks that are created within a task group are synchronized because at the end of the task group, uh, they are guaranteed to be completed. So if barrier and task weight are not the right levels for uh, synchronization, you can uh, work with a task group. I didn't see a code that needed a task group so far, except for a feature that we are not covering here, which is uh, cancellation in OpenMP 4.0. OK, and the runtime library, I think that's on the handout, and this is a list of the environment variables with uh, the most common default. And with that, uh, I think time is over, and uh, that was my second part on the OpenMP introduction.